So, uh, dear Chairman, dear colleagues, uh, thanks for the invitation. In point of fact, I should say that my talk will be much less high-tech than the talk of my, my friend and, and colleague, but I'll try to, to remain a bit clinician. So, uh, you know this slide, that's the situation today in, in Europe. We have uh, two devices, which are CMARC and have been used in more than 40, 45,000 of patients. So it's a reality, it's a daily reality for us. So I'd like to go through um, three different items and uh, maybe extrapolate a little bit what can be seen, not in two or 20, but probably within five years. The first point is patient selection. So I fully agree with what uh, was said by Volmar. Today we are, thank you, today we are addressing patients who are really uh, here, high risk for surgery. So, and here is a statement, uh, which, was, which is the only statement issued uh, today uh, in the um, official literature in peer-reviewed journal. It was done by ESCTS, ESC, EAPCI in 2008. It's not 100% obsolete. Uh, we stress the fact that the assessment should be done by the team. And that's a crucial issue. Uh, treat only patients with severe aortic stenosis, not always easy to know. Only patients who are symptomatic, not always easy to know. Patient with a sufficient life expectancy, very important. One year, two years, six months, well, have to be defined. Patient with contraindication to surgery or high risk to surgery. But I think that in 2008, we were a little bit br quite bright because we put ahead the fact that clinical judgment is the way to assess the risk. And clinical judgment of the team could be supplemented by scoring. But really, the point, the crucial point, is the clinical judgment of the team. And we added a couple of situations, local situation, which could really be good indication if they are correctly assessed. A pink of calcium is not a person in aorta. Um, and a very mild uh, radiation of the thorax performing to 11 is not a contraindication, while a thoracic radiation performed in the 70s for Hodgkin disease is very often a contraindication. And the partner trial do grossly support what we suggested, that it is probably uh, will be indicated in inoperable patients with sufficient life expectancy and should be considered if the team has discussed so, inpatient, high risk, but still operable, and should be considered according to uh, individual anatomy and individual clinical factors. In point of fact, it's a very good news for a patient, because in 2005, we published this from a practice, UART survey, 90 centers in Europe, showing that in many cases, patients with severe aortic stenosis, severe symptoms, were not even shown by the cardiologic to a surgeon, not even discussed. So it was a terrible miss. This figure were reproduced in the States and elsewhere. And now uh, the figure has changed. And this very high risk patient, supposed high risk patient, seen by the cardiologist when they are seen, uh, sent to a um, medical surgical center, they end up with some sort of treatment in more than 70% of cases. It's very good news for the patient. The majority are treated by TAVI. Some are redirected by the team to surgery, but one third will remain, one third will remain under on medical therapy alone because we are not expecting them to derive any benefit from an intervention. So the steps for decision making we, we propose are still there, but now we are facing difficulties because some colleagues propose to treat patients with low gradient, normal ejection fraction. We are a little bit stuck with this new entity with is it a reality, is it um, um, a dream from a non-cardiologist? It could well be a dream from a non-cardiologist and we'll have to carefully assess the presence of severe aortic stenosis in this patient. Conse are the symptoms related to the aortic stenosis could be difficult to determine in COPD. Here you have to work with pneumologists. Assessment of the risk and led consequences of intervention, we know that our scores, the old scores made for surgery, doesn't work very, don't work very well in this setting. We have to refine the assessment of risk of surgery and we have to build new score for TAVI. We have to pay more attention to frailty and other indices. Here we have to work with the attrition in this population and then we have to look at the rest. One point 
with this indication limited to the patient we are treating today is that when we look at the follow-up we have, there is a clear attrition of survival over years. People will die immediately, but continue to die. And we have to understand why they die. And it was shown in source, for example, that most of them will die from non-cardiac causes. And we have to further explore these non-cardiac causes. That's a very important role, potential role, for the new scores, which have to be built. But new score for TAVI, it will take a long time, because we need many, many patients. We need to build um, a score and then to test the score in independent population, it will take time, but it is necessary. And this model, uh, uh, this score is uh, claimed uh, by the Working Group on Valvular Heart Disease of the ESC, and uh, this score should be simple, should be dedicated to valve patient, elaborated in a large spectrum of patients, including, of course, the patient we treat, and it should be tested and updated, a lot of work in front of us. Now we'll have probably also to revisit the current indication. Here is a list of the current indication, uh, exclusion criteria in partner, annulus, bicuspid, CVLV dysfunction, untreated CAD. First of all, measurement of the annulus. Uh, Mr. Chairman alluded to that. Today we have echo, uh, regular echo, 3D echo, CT. That's very good, but provide us with three different numbers. We have to choose. Is it CT? Is it echo? And it is not without consequences to choose one and not the others. And we've shown that if you move from T and take the CT, it will change your indication and choice of prosthesis in as many as 40% of the patient. So now in most centers, decision is built on echo. But many people claim that CT is more accurate. But now we have to build, and Volmar alluded to that, to build some rules, some recommendations based on CT and test them. It's very good to be, let's say, more anatomical. But what we need is a score to predict a safe implantation with minimal aortic rigors. That's what we are aiming at. Bicuspid, it is a relative contraindication. There are very few publications, maybe two uh, case reports and one very short series. Today, we have to be extremely cautious with this patient and take a decision based only on clinical grounds, treat only on patients who cannot be operated, who have a bicuspid. We should consider the annulus, very often large annulus, and the size and distribution of calcium is crucial. Maybe one design is better than the other in this patient. Shall we treat patients with very low ejection fraction? Well, no answer. They are most often excluded from the trials. And uh, one report from Canada showed that after TAVI, the improvement of LV ejection fraction is very good. I think if the ejection fraction is 10% with a big scar following MI, it's no need to do any intervention. The patient won't survive very long. But if you are in doubt, you may use balloon as a bridge to TAVI and reassess the patient. Some centers do TAVI as a first intervention, has to be tested. You may use cardiac assist, so it has to be explored. Coronary disease, we have no no study except a few retrospective monocentric study to answer this question. We need randomized trial to give an answer. Today, for the time being, we have to individualize according to the patient, the location of the disease, and also the suitability for PCI and myocardial at risk. In most centers, in most cases, we go direct for TAVI, but here we are going in a very elderly population. If we want to go down in risk, we'll have to consider doing some revascularization and then the TAVI and maybe reconsider surgery. It's an open question. But the real question you are expecting here is to know if we can go to lower risk patient. And here I'd like to tell you, and you know that, patients are coming and asking, doctor, we don't want the big scar. We want to be treated with a new method. We saw your paper in the newspaper. <coughs> Uh, and why do they come? Because, as usual, they want less painful, short hospital stay, uh, early recovery, etc., etc. 
And in point of fact, as Volmar said, if we look at the euro score in the current series, sometimes the euro score of patient treated is in the range of 10 to 15 percent. So clearly, we are treating in some centers very low risk patients. I agree with Volmar, with euro score, you don't catch all the reality. You may have a low euro score and a terrible radiation of the uh, chest. You may have other contraindications like cirrhosis, etc., etc., which are not taken into account in this slide. But we have to be extremely cautious not to reproduce what we've seen in certain centers for PCI. What we have to do, said your Secretary General Secretary, is that we have to come as soon as possible with good evidence. First, we need follow-up. Volmar told you three to five years, maybe six years, seven years. We need more, especially if we are targeting lower risk patients, not to know how it will occur, the dysfunction, but when it will occur. Then we have to build a randomized trial. In Denmark, as usual, they are the pioneers. They design, and this trial is ongoing. One arm is already stopped, but the other one is continuing. This trial will be underpowered. The other trial, there are two trials. There are the partner two in the U.S., but I uh, don't have the design here. But Sirtavi will be run in Europe. What is very interesting here is the patient will be seen by all comers, will be seen by the heart team. It will be included only if the STS is between what is expected higher range of the mortality for aortic valve replacement and twice this higher range, STS 3 to 8, and the decision will be based on clinical judgment. So there is a move from the magic number to the clinical judgment of the team, Low risk surgery, high risk TAVI registry in the middle, we don't know, we randomize. And within three years, hopefully, we'll get the result. That is very important. New indication also is a valve in a valve. Very attractive concept because many patients coming with bioprosthesis. What are the results so far? Relatively few patients reported, very few. So it's preliminary. Not all the size of prosthesis were tackled. The use of TF and um, transapical varies. Procedural success are quite high. Mortality is quite low. And absence of AR is quite frequent. And function is quite good, but very low number. It is preliminary. And this Russian doll um, attitude will have limit. We need longer series with longer follow-up. And we have to refine our selection criteria maybe to use selected devices. But really, if it works, and in my opinion it will work, this will completely change the face of cardiac surgery and decrease what is already decreasing, it is the age of bioprosthesis implantation. Another point is, are we going to implant in patients with CV aortic regurge? My answer is no. There are anecdotal cases showing that it has been done for very strong clinical incentive. The problem is, we won't treat the disease of the ascending aorta, which is present in most patients, so it is not an option. The devices, Volmar went very fast. Now we have uh, the two existing valves going down and down in size, improving as regards the durability, very similar to the surgically implanted valve. Progress are being made, and we are going down in terms of annulus and going up in terms of annulus. We can treat more patients. He alluded to the new processes design, uh, so I won't repeat it, but we should know if the retrievability or positionability won't be paid by the less durability. Now procedure. The procedure which should we perform only in centers with cardiologists and cardiac surgeons, it is crucial. And if you are in Leipzig or in certain rich countries, you can expect to work in hybrid room. It's very good, but it will probably be mandatory if we want to lower the risk, because if we are treating patients at low risk for surgery in a couple of years, we cannot afford to let them die because we are unable to convert. The procedure is going to get simpler and simpler. I fully agree with what was said. Delivery catheter will go down. Probably 16 French will be available very soon. Maybe we can uh, jump over balloon dilatation in the self-expendable process in certain cases. Cardiac support is not needed in all cases, but should always be available. And finally, anesthesia. Most of the patients now transfemorally are treated under local anesthesia, but anesthesiologists should be present because these patients are very sick. Now, we have a lot of discussion, TFTA, to me, the only option is to be able to use the best technique 
for your individual patient and the centers treating many patients now should be able to offer the most adapted treatment, either transapical, transfemoral, direct aortic access or transaxillary. We should not oppose this technique which have never been compared in a FASA fast We should be able to use all of them. Navigation positioning, I apologize for my poor uh, man slide. Uh, Mini TE, well, let's see. Dynacity, very good. There are other devices which can help to adapt. That's important. MRI guided TAVI will occur, uh, firstly in Germany, maybe a couple of decades after in France, but it is uh, in the future. It will be uh, the way to assess with a single shot the result. We, if we want to expand to lower risk, we should have a safer procedure. No doubt this rate of stroke is too high, but we have to work very closely, understand this stroke, and maybe uh, uh, use a device to protect the patient and improve uh, anticoagulation therapy. Vascular complication, still too high, good teamwork, good imaging, and choose many different approaches not to force the transfemoral will help. Arctic regurg is not good when it is moderate to severe. Once again, good imaging on the annulus, good placement, pacemaker still too high with one type, uh, renal failure could occur. So here is a slide from Patrick Serra. It's grossly the same slide as shown by uh, Volmar. And you see that the number of TAVI is increasing, but surgery made a jump up also, and the very good news for a patient is that more patients are treated. 50,000 in 2007, more than 73,000. That's a very good news for the patient. The investors also have their view on the future, and the investors claim that next year, next year, uh, the transcatheter heart valve will be um, uh, superior, more frequently used to the surgical implant of bioprosthesis. I won't say that once again they made a mistake, but um, we have, may probably will have to wait a couple of extra years. But the trend is there. The trend is there. More intervention will be performed, which once again is a very good news for the patient. To conclude, what are the keys for success? The keys for success, I repeat and repeat again, is the team approach, which should be there to select the patient, to perform the procedure, and to follow the patient. You asked me about the referral patterns, and I think that it's a common box, and the patient will come either from the surgeon, from the cardiologist, fortunately not from the anesthesiologist, uh, very often from the imaging specialist, and we'll have to discuss them as a team. It should become a routine in the center, and only large centers are able to provide this sort of accurate assessment. And all these people should be there, but should accept to collaborate and should be properly trained. Careful training is essential. To reach this high, very high rate of procedural success, you should have a very careful procedural training. Right now it is done by the company, very carefully done, but it should be done also. That is, to me, the role of the scientific societies. Good evaluation is key. Fortunately, in this field, it is moving very fast and in the right direction. There are efforts to standardize the endpoint, there are also randomized trials only a couple of years after the birth of the new therapy. It is very good news in a domain where randomized trials are extremely rare. And we have also very interesting registry, which are device-based, but also multi-device, real-life registry. So with the combination of all these studies, we can better assess uh, things. So to conclude, dear colleagues, I think that the very important thing is to stress the fact that today and in 2020, it should be done by expert centers in valvular heart disease. Should be done by a team, carefully trained, with very good imaging, as you've seen in the future, or go to Zurich and visit that, and this will remain essential. Today, TAVI should be restricted to inoperable or high-risk patients, as assessed by the team. But we have to work. It's time to work. We have to better re-stratify for the risk of surgery, but also for the efficacy, short and long term, of TAVI. We have to do a better TAVI, that is to say, a safer TAVI. It is already effective, but a safer TAVI. We have to work on durability, uh, feasibility of subsequent intervention. Well, we, we know that it can be done, but we have to work on that. But the key 
message for the procedure is to be safer and also easier and easier. It will be embraced, and you saw from uh, Volmar how technology is moving. And when this will be there, we can definitely and we will definitely move to lower risk patient. I don't know when it will occur on a based, evidence based, but it will occur within a couple of years. And I hope and I think that in the future we'll see this trend. Whatever uh, the one will do the procedure, here is a PCI, and PCI came and came and increased. Cabbage plateaued a little bit, but the good news is the total number of patients treated increased. That is very good for a patient. That is the point which is the most important uh, to us, to treat a larger number of patients, either by a safer and safer surgery or interventional cardiology. So thank you for attention.